Perhaps we should first review where we are in this little lecture series. Okay, basically on Monday we reviewed general relativity, and then yes, uh, on Tuesday and yesterday we developed a three plus one decomposition. Okay, and that means we basically foliated space-time into a, f a foliation of spatial hypersurfaces. We projected tensors onto that sli onto those slices and onto the normal, and then we decomposed Einstein's equations too. And in the process, Einstein's equations, we, see, uh, uh, we, we rewrote Einstein's equations in, in a set of equations that we call the ADM equations, or at least that's what they usually call. call. And really that's one set, it, it splits into a set of constraint equations and a set of evolution equations. I told you that a set of equations like this uh, brings the, the formulation into basically a Cauchy problem. That means we can construct initial data by solving the constraint equations. Then we can evolve those initial data in, into the future, forward in time, using the evolution equation. So that is an approach to solving Einstein's equations that is well suited for numerical applications. Okay? So we completed that yesterday. And I'm glad that we had some time yesterday afternoon to talk in more depth what these equations mean, what the role of the labs and shift is. We've done some examples to understand what is going on with these equations. And uh, that basically sets us up for the rest of this week. And basically what we're going to do, or what's still on the to-do list, is we want to talk separately about how to cons solve the constraint equations, how to solve the evolution equations. So they, today we'll focus on the constraint equations. So we'll st start studying methods for solving these constraint equations, okay? meaning we want to uh, basically be, be able to find techniques that allow us to construct initial data that describe the gravitation fields at one instant of time. Now one more thing. The form of these, these equations, even though this looks pretty messy and there are many different symbols and indices in there, is actually very similar to Maxwell's equations. Okay? In Maxwell's equations also, they also split into a set of constraint equations, a set of constraint uh, and a set of evolution equations. These equations are the, the cousins, if you want, of the constraint equations, Maxwell's equa uh, constraint equations, which are the diff equations, which do not contain any time derivatives of the electromagnetic fields. Whereas these equations are the cousins of the curl equations, which do contain time derivatives of the electromagnetic fields and tell you how they evolve forward in time. And then actually, both today and tomorrow, we'll exploit that similarity to get some more insight and intuition as to what is going on and how we have to solve these. Okay? All right, so today we start a new chapter. We, we three. We, we talk about solving the constraint equations. Okay. Actually, let's talk, instead of talking about GR, let's switch back. Let's talk about Maxwell's equations. Let's consider Maxwell's. And actually, I only want to look at the constraint equations today. Constraint equations. We have two of them. The divergence of E has to be 4 pi rho. And the divergence of B has to be 0. That means we cannot choose the electric field and the magnetic field arbitrarily at any instant of time. Instead, whatever we choose, they have to satisfy these two equations. Okay? How many unknowns do we have? Given rho, that is. okay, And given the value for pi, that is. okay. Anyway, so uh, now how many equations do we have? Two, does that mean we can solve for all the fields? No, no we absolutely cannot. Okay, so uh, we have six unknowns and two equations. By the way, um, okay, so, uh, so that means this system is underdetermined. Okay, we cannot get, we cannot solve for all of the fields. What is the situation in GR? How many unknowns do we have in the constraint equations here? 12, right? Because there's six in the spatial metric, six in the excentric curvature. They're both three-dimensional symmetric tensors. A three-dimensional symmetric tensor has six unknowns. So there's a total of 12, uh, 12 unknowns. How many equations do we have? How many constraint equations are there? Four. So it's a similar situation. It's also underdetermined. Okay? What do we need to do in that case? So, okay, we conclude this is underdetermined. The best we can do is we can choose four of these unknowns, six unknowns, and then we can use the equations to solve for the remaining two. Okay, so the idea is that we choose four, 
then compute 2. Okay? Formally, we then call the four variables that we choose freely, we, co we call those freely specifiable because we can specify them freely, they're unconstrained. And then we, the, the two that we solve for, those we call the constraint ones because we use the constraint equation to solve for those. Okay. So we call these four the freely specifiable ones. Specifiable, okay. And these two we call the constraints, constraint ones. Okay. Now here's a conceptual issue. You tell me which ones are which. Like EX, for example, is that constraint or freely specifiable? You have a question? No, okay, sorry. Okay. So that you know that's not clear, of course. So the general procedure for solving these kind of problems then is we have to first decide, okay, we first have to separate our, all of our variables, and in this case all the six variables, into which ones will be freely specifiable and which ones will be, will, will be constrained. Then we make a choice for the freely specifiable ones, and then in the last step we solve for the constrained variables. Okay, so the general outline is this. We choose which variable is which, i.e. which variable is freely specifiable versus constrained, that procedure, that's what we, ref that's what we refer to as choosing a de decomposition. Okay, so we are choosing a decomposition. Essentially, that means we separate the variables into freely specifiable and constrained variables. Okay? So we choose a decomposition. Okay? To separate the freely specifiable variables from the constraint variables, okay? Then we make choices for the freely specifiable ones. For the former. And finally, we solve the constraint equations for the latter. So that's, in essence, what we do when we choose a particular decomposition of the constraint equations. All right? Now, the first technique in doing that is to basically, how do we do this for, con for Einstein's equations? Okay, how do we get started with that? Well, very, one very common technique in doing that is the conformal, using a conformal decomposition or conformal transformation. Okay? And this is how it works. Conformal decompositions. Let's go back to Maxwell's equations one more time. Okay? I could suggest to you, let's say we want to solve this equation for the electric fields, I could suggest to you, why don't we choose EX and EY and then we solve this equation for EZ. Okay? Maybe this is not a particularly nice equation to solve, but at least in principle we could be tempted to do that. Okay? The issue with that is that it's, it's ugly, right? Why would we single out EZ over EX and Y? There should be a symmetry between the, the different coordinates. I mean, why would we want to treat different coordinates differently? That's, it's awkward, right? So let me write that down. So we could choose, choose EG, EX, and EY, okay? Then solve for EZ, okay? But that introduces this asymmetry between the components, okay, which may offend our aesthetical you know, expectations for how to solve this problem, right? So here's an alternative. What we could instead do, we could say, you know what we'll do? We'll Instead of solving for an unknown, we introduce a new variable and then we solve you know, for a product of two unknowns. Okay? So we could write the following. I could write e, EI equals some factor phi times an EI bar. Okay? 
And now what, uh, I consider this EI bar as some kind of a background field. Okay, maybe I, you know, okay, okay that is defined basically up to a scale. And then I use the constraint equation to solve for the scale. Okay, so I could choose what we call a background field. Okay, so I choose an e bar x, an e bar y, e bar z. Okay, and so I treat all of the different uh, components the, the exactly the same way. But what I leave open is the overall scale of this field, and then and then I use the constraint equations to solve for that scale, and then I have avoided this asymmetry between the different components. Okay, so this I then basically solve for the overall. Scale. Well, I mean, I, I'm always allowed to write an unknown as a product of two unknowns, sure, sure, right? For example, do you know this background field? Uh, no, I mean, I mean, nobody gives me this background field, right? I mean, Moses didn't come down from the mountain saying, "Oh, the background field is this," right? No, it, it, so you have, to, you have to make a choice, okay? And then given this choice, so in other words, what we've done now is we've said, okay, these E bars, those are now our freely specifiable variables. We choose those freely. And then we can solve for this overall factor, okay? The real issue is if you inserted this into that equation, you wouldn't get a nice equation at all. And they, you, know, you could raise your hand and say, oh, but you know, is that an equation that we can, is actually well posed and whatnot? And I don't even want to get into that, okay? That's not the point. The point is that here's, here's a trick. We write our unknowns as a product of two unknowns, okay? We then make choices for part of those unknowns. Those are the freely specifiable variables. And then we have an unknown left that we solve for in the, in the constraint equation, okay? So if you want, it's just, it's a mathematical trick. It, okay, in a minute it will be a mathematical trick when we do that for GR. It turns out there's a larger mathematical structure, if equivalence classes of conformal spaces and whatnot, but for our purpose we can ignore that, okay? Yes? No, not necessarily. Uh, actually, if you make a choice for the background field. But, but no, I mean basically I can see I, I do I'm doing this just to solve the constraint equations. But finally you want to evolve the data. That's right. But then out of that, this class of But the, I don't care anymore. I, 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 I do this only to find this at t equals zero. And then I, I accept this as my initial data at t equals zero. They solve the constraints. Yeah. I can now use these fields, the real physical fields, in my evolution equations and evolve those. So basically, as soon as you're done solving the, the constraint equations, and once you've constructed your initial data, you are encouraged okay, to throw this decomposition back out of the window because it will, it will not be maintained later on in general. Okay? All right? And also, how do you choose four, like one, five, and three? So, no, no, we choose these three, okay, and then we solve for that one, okay. Now, you could be concerned, you could say, but wait, you know, didn't we say here we have three, th three variables in E? How come now we have four? This looks like four, but really it's only three because the overall scale, it, 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 we can factor out the overall scale of EI because it will be absorbed in this anyway. So, so you can think of this as, you know, it, it matters only up to an overall scale because the overall scale is hidden in here. Okay? Now I think you had a question too. Can you always make this choice or is there any condition under which you should make it? Okay, so this you should not take too seriously because this is just a little, I, I meant this as a little motivation at, 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 you know, on the basis of Maxwell's equations. Okay, in a minute we'll... Yes, but it, so in a, in a minute we'll do the same thing for GR, and then there are conditions for what choices we can make, okay? Because we want th those choices to result in, in well-defined differential operators, okay? Yeah. Yes? Um, to what, is, is this coordinate dependent? Is, is that what you mean? Is phi coordinate dependent? 
Um, I mean, it's part of the metric, right? You know what? Okay, t tell you what. Let's move on. Let me, let me write down a few more things, and then you can ask that question again, okay? Let's not overinterpret this, okay? In a minute, we'll write, do the, exactly the same thing for Einstein's equation, and we're welcome to entertain all of these questions. Then they're well-defined, okay? Um, all right. And that is I write my spatial metric, gamma ij, as a conformal factor psi to the 4 times a so-called conformally related metric, which is now gamma bar ij. Okay? So this gamma bar ij is what I call the conformally related metric. Okay? This psi is the conformal factor is called the conformal factor. And you may wonder about the 4. That is chosen just for convenience. That's an interesting spelling of convenience, isn't it? But uh, oh con con convenience. There, that's much better. OK. All right? So again, basically, for our purposes, I can just say, Gamma ij is our unknown, all right? I can always write an unknown as a product of two unknowns, okay? That may or may not be a good idea, but, you know, there's nobody says this is illegal, you know? I'm just writing it that way, okay? In this case, it is actually a good idea, all right? Now, again, basically, you, you may wonder, but wait, am I just now making seven unknowns out of this six unknowns? Really, gamma bar ij matters only up to a scale because a any overall scale can be absorbed in this conformal factor. Okay? Now, again, also, there's a whole equivalence class of conformally related spaces. I don't think we have time to get into that, so I'll just, for our purpose, we can just think of this as, this as a mathematical trick. Okay? So we can see what happens with that. All right? The gamma bar, though, so that's the conformally related metric, it specifies the geometry of this related conformal space. Okay. Yes? Okay, so it is almost the same. In a minute, actually, we'll, we'll see that we can use the, the gamma bar to absorb our freely specifiable variables, and we can make a free choice for that one, and then we can solve the Hamiltonian constraint for the conformal factor psi. Okay? So that means we could choose, for example, the conformally related space to be flat. Then this will be a flat space. In fact, we'll do that in a minute or in a few minutes. Okay? And then, basically, all the curvature comes com from the conformal factor. Okay? Now let's be careful though. Um, I'm doing this only for the spatial part. Okay? Now in a different context, people also study conformal transformations of the space-time. Okay? And in fact, what you learn in that context is the invariance of the wild tensor under conformal transformations. That's why sometimes the wild tensor is called the conformal tensor. That is true only for conformal transformations of the space-time. We're doing conformal transformations of only the spatial part here. Okay. Okay. So this is the metric. I also rescale the inverse metric with a psi to the minus four gamma ij. And the reason you want to do that is so that gamma ij with bar with the indices upstairs is the inverse of this conformally related metric. And we can see that that's true just by doing a little piece of math. What is gamma ik? The, the gamma factor. Well. In our physical space, I can write that as gamma i j j k, right? Everybody happy with that? If I got the indices right? Yes, I did. Okay. Now I can use my conformal rescaling to both of these metri uh, metrics. Then I get psi to the minus 4 from the inverse one, gamma i j. I'm sorry, j. Then I get psi 4 for gamma bar j k. Now we notice that the two psi's cancel each other, and I only get gamma bar ij, gamma jk bar, and that means that 
these are now inverse of each other. Okay? So basically now we can raise and lower indices of conformally related objects with this conformally related um, uh, uh, metric. Now we want to actually, in a minute, study the, the, the curvature of these, these spaces. Okay? Or we want to express things in terms of this conformal factor and the conformally related metric. The next object that comes right after we've introduced the metric is the, the connection, right? So basically, just like in this outline that we do, did on Monday in GR, we started with a metric, then we wrote down the connection coefficients. We do the same thing here. Basically, now we have gamma i, j, k. This is the Christoffel symbol that is associated with a spatial metric gamma i, j. Now, how do we compute that? Well, it's basically derivatives of gamma i, j. Now I insert psi to the 4 gamma bar ij into that. Okay? Now I get two types of derivatives. I get derivatives of the gamma ij bars, and I get derivatives of psi. Right? Now the derivatives of gamma ij bars I can collect. Okay? And guess what? I'll get a new, they take the exact same form as a Christoffel symbol, and I write that as the Christoffel symbol that is associated with the conformally related metric. That gives me a gamma gamma bar i, j, k, that is now the Christoffel symbol that is associated with gamma bar, okay? And then I get additional terms from the conformal factor. There are three of them because they're three different derivatives, right? And I can write them as delta i, j, partial k, log psi, plus delta i, k, partial j, log psi, and maybe I'll make some more room here. And one more term, minus gamma bar j k gamma bar i l partial l log psi. And in fact, today, this afternoon, in the tutorial, I'll ask you to derive that. It's a few lines calculations, and you just derived it. Not a big deal. Okay. So this is now associated with gamma bar i j. Okay. We, so we say that's the connection associated with gamma r. By J, uh, I, we have a bar IJ that defines us a conformally, uh, uh, also a covariant derivative that is associated with our conformally related metric, and I'll denote that with a D bar. Okay, so if you go back to this handout that I gave you on Monday with the convention, okay, you'll see that all these curvature-related objects that are associated with the conformally related metric they now carry a bar to distinguish it from the physical objects, right? spatial objects. Yes? No, no, you don't worry about the coordinates, okay? I, it, I, I mean, it's, it's often referred to as a co transformation. Maybe the word, word rescaling would be more appropriate. So we're not changing the coordinates. At each point of fixed coordinates, I'm saying I'm writing the metric as a different metric times a scalar. Okay, or times, times a factor, okay? So think of it as a conformal rescaling, if you want, okay? Yeah. Okay, now what was the next object that we looked at when we went through GR? The Riemann tensor, I'll skip that one. We'll go right to the Ricci tensor, okay? It turns out that the Ricci tensor, you won't be surprised. I mean, look, this object divided into one object that is associated with gamma ij bar and additional derivatives of the conformal factor. The same thing is true for the, uh, for the Ricci tensor. We can write the Ricci tensor, our physical Ricci tensor, as an Rij bar, which is you compute exactly as you compute Rij, except you use gamma Ij bar instead of gamma Ij. Okay? And then we have an additional term, which sometimes you know, we could write as Rij psi. And Rij psi is the object that you get from all the conformal factors. Okay, and actually, I'll write it down for you. Okay, uh, there are four terms. Rij psi equals minus 2. And now we have a di bar, dj bar, log psi plus gamma ij bar, gamma bar uh, ln dl dm log psi, and then we have two more, plus four 
d i d bar log psi times um, d bar j log psi uh, minus gamma bar i j gamma bar l m times d l log psi d uh, m log psi. Okay, so just for your reference, you could you could prove this by inserting these into the expression for the Ricci tensor, and a few hours later you would have it. Okay, right? It's not. It's there's nothing particularly difficult. It's just math and partial derivatives and whatnot. But by the end of the day, you, you get that. All right. What was the next object that we need? Well, we need the trace of R, okay? Right? For example, in our Hamiltonian constraint, that's where we had it. Okay, so we now take the trace of this. But you can already tell, well, many of these terms are the same. They're just these different kind of derivatives of this. So if we take the trace of this, actually it will become a fair bit easier. And in fact, the trace reduces to the following. And R, the physical R, is psi to the minus 4 times R bar, that's what we compute from the conformally related metric, minus 8 times psi to the minus 5 d bar squared psi, okay, where this is defined as gamma ij di dj. So it's the Laplace operator in your conformally related space, all right? Okay, so that's, that's all, okay? Now we can go back and say, oh, great, let's insert this into our Hamiltonian constraint. Then we get this. So we insert in, into the Hamiltonian D squared psi, there's we insert, replace this, right? And I'll solve for that one. And so that means I'll insert this, then I'll divide by this factor so that I get this beautiful Laplace operator acting on psi. And then the other terms are minus psi divided by eight times r bar plus psi to the five divided by eight times kij, kij minus k squared equals minus 2 pi psi to the 5 rho. And you just insert that into what you have for the Hamiltonian constraint. This is what you should find. Okay? There's nothing profound. Okay? Yeah? Sorry? Yes, we, we will. So the question is, are we going to apply conformal rescaling of the extended curvature too? And we, we will, we will do that, okay? But we're not quite there yet, okay? So th that is really the next step, because you realize that really we also need to solve the momentum constraint, and probably a reformal rescaling will help that too, and it does, okay? But uh, we'll postpone that for 20 minutes or so, in the meantime, we will look at this equation for it, okay? And we, we now realize what we can do is we can choose a conformally related metric, okay? We can, we can decide, okay, the conformally related metric, that will be our freely specifiable variable or variables, okay? And if we do that, we can insert that in here. Where does that enter? Well, it enters, for example, in the, in the Ricci scalar that is associated with that metric. It also enters in these covariant derivative operators, okay? But then we can solve this equation for psi. So this is nice, right? Because, look, we started out with the Hamiltonian constraint in the form where I wouldn't even know how to start, how to solve that, right? There's the Ricci, mm -hmm. the Ricci scalar, but how do you choose? I mean, how do you, it's hard to figure out how, how do I choose a, a metric so that it gives me a certain form of the Ricci scalar that then satisfy the Hamilton, satisfies the Hamiltonian constraint. Whereas now we know exactly, well, we just need to solve. We, we, we pick the conformally related metric, and then we have 
a Poisson type equation to solve for psi. And if we, once we've solved that equation, we multiply the conformal related metric with that conformal factor to the fourth power, and we automatically have solved the Hamiltonian constraint. Okay, so now we've re reduced the problem to just solving a Poisson type equation. Okay, mind you, it's nonlinear. Okay, there, there are some issues, but, but nevertheless, that is nice. Okay, so let me write this down. We can, can do the following we choose gamma bar ij as freely specifiable. Okay. That gives us R bar, and it also gives us the form of the covariant, op uh, covariant derivative because the Christoffel symbols that are associated with that. But then we can solve for psi. Okay? Of course, you are absolutely right. We also need to solve the constraint equations. Okay? And we will do that in a few minutes. But in the meantime, we could also say, well, why don't we look at initial data for which the extended curvature is 0? Okay? And uh, if that means we look at a moment of time symmetry. And in fact, why don't we do exactly that? And we'll work out some, an example to, of a solution to that. Okay. So elementary solutions. To the Hamiltonian constraint. Okay, so what I'll do is we have to make certain choices for you know what we want to solve the Hamiltonian constraint to construct initial data, but of course the initial data they contain some physics, so we want to we need to make choices as to what kind of physics this is supposed to describe. Okay, so we'll choose, we're interested in black holes. So let's choose vacuum to start with, right? Vacuum. So that means, so to get black hole solutions, so I'll choose rho equals zero and also si equals zero, okay? Which appears in a, in a momentum constraint. Then I'll choose time symmetry. Time symmetry essentially means that the extended curvature is zero. That, it's, that kind of makes sense because the extended curvature is related to the time derivative of the spatial metric. At a moment of time symmetry, we want that time derivative to be zero. So we set kij equals zero. If kij is zero and if the momentum density is zero, that means that the momentum constraint is satisfied identically. Okay, so we don't have to worry about that. So the momentum constraint is solved identically. Okay. Now we, that means we only have to solve the um, uh, Hamiltonian constraint. Actually, in fact, we should, maybe we should put a box around it. Okay. Okay. So this term is already zero. This term is already zero. We, we're not sure yet about these terms, but what I'll choose now is in fact conformal flatness. That's what you were suggesting a minute. Okay. So, okay. so I'll choose conformal flatness. Conformal flatness. Okay. That means I'll choose my gamma ij bar, the conformally related metric, to be the flat metric, which I denote as eta ij. Now, remember in my notation, eta ij is not 1, 1, 1 necessarily, because it is 1, 1, 1 only in Cartesian coordinates, but maybe we're solving this in, in spherical polar coordinates. So this is the flat metric, this eta denotes the flat metric in any coordinate system that you may want to choose. Now, if this is true, what is R bar? It's zero because this is a flat metric, so the Ricci tensor will be zero, right? So this implies that R bar is zero, right? What is, uh, what is this covariant derivative operator, di bar? What is that? So in partial in, in Cartesian coordinates it will just be partial derivatives but if we use co 
curvilinear coordinates, like spherical polar coordinates, we get extra terms, okay, but those are, it, it's still a covariant derivative, but it's it, a flat covariant derivative, okay? So this is now di bar is the flat covariant derivative, okay? In whatever coordinate system we choose, so it would be partial derivatives in Cartesian coordinates, but others in others, okay? Then the Hamiltonian constraint. What is the Hamiltonian constraint now? It is? It's the Laplace equation, right? Our old friend, the Laplace equation. Maybe I should write it like this, okay? Psi equals zero. This is, and this is now a flat Laplace operator, right? So that's what our Hamiltonian constraint boiled down to under these assumptions. Okay? Yes? So, so is it true that in three dimensions any metric is flat? No. Then, uh, Next question. No. <laughs> yes? Then uh, how can I do this? Uh, if uh, I have a general metric, it is not probably flat? Because I make choices. I mean, basically, I have free choices. Right? It's just like in ENM. If you construct initial data in ENM, nobody tells you what, <coughs> nobody can tell you what all the components are. You have free choices. In this case, I can make the choice to make the conform related metric flat, okay? But I have to be aware that that will not capture every possible configuration of the metric, okay? But, but it does give me valid solutions to the constraint equations, but it is a choice. Now it is, by the way, it is true in spherical symmetry. I can always write the metric in this form where it's conformally flat. But if we, if we have deviations from spherical symmetry, we cannot do that. Okay. So, so you mean yes. The spatial. The spatial. Just the spatial metric. Mm -hmm. Okay. So All right. Just one. A factor times the flat matrix. So I can always see the spatial metric. Please say it again. What is? A factor times. Yeah. No, any spherically symmetric spatial metric. Only in spherical symmetry. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Now, by the way, in spherical symmetry, what is that operator in spherical symmetry? When have you seen that operator in spherical symmetry the last time? Sorry? On Monday afternoon, right? I had you derive that operator, right? So, right? So in spherical symmetry, actually, that's wrong. What I just told you, I had you derive it in spherical polar coordinates. Right. But then if we apply spherical symmetry, we can even set the theta and phi derivatives to zero. And all we have left is one over r squared partial partial r times r squared partial psi partial r equals zero. Right. What are the what is the general solution to this? This is solved by How many independent solutions do I get to this? Two, right? Because it's a second order operator. So I get two independent, uh, independent solutions. Do we agree that a constant is one of them? Because a constant partial i is, gives me 0, right? And then I can do whatever I want to it, and it's still 0, OK? So I certainly have a constant. What is the other term that I can get? It's, yes, or a constant plus b divided by r, because taking the derivative with r gives me 1 over r squared. You multiply with r squared, gets a constant, and then it's 0, right? So this is the general solution, OK? Now, so these are constants, which a priori I don't know yet, OK? But I can, for example, pick a solution by choosing a equals 1, because in that case, as I go to large r, as I go to infinity, 
I'll discover, I'll get the Minkowski metric back. Okay, so this gives me asymptotically Minkowski. Okay, also if we measured the mass of this resulting solution, we would find that uh, um, B choose and, and, and we write B equals M divided by 2, okay? So basically, where M is the mass. That, that we can only do if we know how to measure the mass of the space, which we'll skip over for now. But in fact, we can identify this, okay? And then what we get is that Psi equals 1 plus M divided by 2R, is it not? Have we ever seen that before? This is a triumph, right? Because we just derived the spatial metric for Schwarzschild in isotropic coordinates, okay? We should be very happy about this. We went through this whole, whole formalism, and here it is, okay? So this is an old friend of ours. It's always fun to meet old friends, uh, old friends again, okay? All right? Now, of course, the skeptical among you could ask the following. Are we crazy? We derived this on day one, directly from Schwarzschild. Why did we have to spend painful hours going through the 3 plus 1 formalism, through conformal transformations, rescaling, who knows what, only to discover something that we already knew all along? Okay. So what is this formalism good for anyway? Right. Well, here's something neat. Notice something. Einstein's equations are nonlinear, correct? How about this equation? It is linear. So what can you do when you have a linear equation? You can add solutions. So if we have a solution for one black hole, we also have a solution for, for two black holes, right? And if we have a solution for two, we also have, why stop at two, three? We could, now we can superimpose these solutions, however many we want, and we can construct initial data for your favorite number of black holes, something you've always wanted to do, okay? Okay, so, right, let's write that down. Yes? Okay, by sheer magic, okay? No, it basically, I notice if I, I choose A equals 1 because I want it to be Minkowski asymptotically, that gives me a solution. And if, if, I, no, if I now shared a secret with you, and that is how do we compute the mass of the resulting space, then we would find out that the mass is 2 times B. Okay? And so that, that, that entitles me to write this constant B as M half, and then I get this solution. Okay? Yes? Yes. You know, I, I'm not. I, I don't think I quite understood your question. Is so it, the, yeah? the size that you get. Yes. I'm sure you can make some connection, but it's not quite that direct, okay? So I'm not sure that, that analogy is helpful in this context, okay? Okay. Yes. This one is spherical symmetry, right? So it's some preferred center that we have some. True. So now we get away from symmetry. Absolutely, yes, uh, absolutely. Y yes, we will break spherical symmetry, but Basically, it's still a valid solution. Right. Yes. Um. So, okay, let's note equation one, which was this one. I called this one equation one, okay, until I call the next equation equation one also, okay. No, actually, I call this one two. Okay, great. Okay, so, but no, one is linear. So, so I can add solutions of the form two to construct multiple black hole
uh, spaces. Okay, how do I do that? Well, I write psi equals a one. I'll, I only want one, one, okay, because that is my asymptotic solution. But now I can add several of these other terms. So for example, I could label them by alpha and then an m alpha divided by two r alpha, okay, where r alpha measures the distance of any coordinate location to any one of the centers of these black holes. Now, if we drew an embedding diagram of this solution, we would get this, fun, fu uh, this funny uh, uh, picture, this wormhole picture that looks like this. You've probably seen that in somewhere, right? Basically, it's a wormhole that connects two slices. By the way, that's, um, to motivate this, I also ask you on Monday to figure out this, what does this isotropic radius do? And you notice that it only covers the exterior of the black hole. But because it was this quadratic equation, it, it covers the exterior of the black hole twice. You get two isotropic radii. Well, there's, here's one, here's the other, other solution for R. Okay? So this is the image, the, the embedding diagram that you get for this solution. Now, if we add multiple of these, then you get an image that looks like something like this. So for two black holes, you might have one black hole that connects to one other universe and then another one that looks like this and connects to an to another one, okay? Something like that, okay? Now we could do all kinds of things. We could symmetrize these. We could use inverse mass techniques to symmetrize these, but we won't get into that. People have done a lot of work on that, okay? Also, as a reminder, how, how, why is it that we cannot get these by solving Einstein's equations? Why did you not learn about these solutions when you took a general relativity course? At least I'm, I'm making an assumption here, but okay. But, well, of course, these are solutions only at t equals zero. Remember, we only solve the constraint equations. These are only valid at one instant of time. As soon as we let these black holes go, the solution will become a lot more complicated. If this is a moment of time symmetry, for example, these two black holes will start accelerating towards each other. It's a dynamical solution. It's a lot more complicated, nonlinear, who knows what. Okay? So that, to find that out, we have to solve the evolution equations. I suggest we take a really short break now, and then after the break, we'll talk about what we do with the extended curvature so that we can solve the momentum constraints. Okay? All right. If you make choices for some parts of the electromagnetic fields when you solve the diff equations, you make choices on is there an electromagnetic wave or not. Okay? Likewise, basically our choice for the conformally related metric will affect the, f the physical uh, 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 the physical content of the initial data that you end up with, okay? Right? Does that clarify some of that? Okay. Now, uh, uh, basically, is it true that, I can t that any spatial metric is conformally flat, i.e. Can, I can write it as a conformal factor times the, conform uh, times the flat metric? No, absolutely not, okay? But can I make that choice to construct initial data? I can do that. But of course, that already automatically results in a certain physical content of the initial data that I've fixed by this conformal flatness, which may or may not be a good choice. That's a separate question, OK? I, I'm just claiming it gives me a solution, OK? Is that the solution that I want? That's a separate question, OK? All right? Yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Even with the single black hole case, yeah. you just do the other thing in my hand or, or, or when, you, when you have these two? Yes. Even for the single black hole case, yes. you mm -hmm. do this, uh, this bridge. Yes. Uh, but is that part of the, and the way you set up the initial data, there seem to be only one flat metric, and so only one asymptotic. Right. Okay, so, so are you just looking at one? Okay, so basically, I mean, the, the solution, right, for the, so what I get is my metric is psi to the 4 times gamma ij, right? And psi for a single black hole is now 1 plus m divided by 2r, right? And now, it, 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 this is what happens, okay? You, you're, you're asking basically, if I understand you correctly, how can this be? I start with gamma ij bar, which is just flat. It's just one sheet. And not yes. only it's one sheet, it's flat, okay? So how come I now end up with two of those sheets, okay? So well, what happens is this, this psi gives me the overall scale, okay? 
the physical stick is. So at each value of r, that tells me basically about how much proper distances are inflated, right? Basically, it, proper distance becomes larger by this psi. Go to r equals 0, and you notice that now this term diverges, it, 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 right? OK, so as I move just a tiny bit around at r equals 0, all of a sudden, I, I get infinite proper distances, OK? What you can imagine is you take one point in this flat, flat uh, space, okay? But now you multiply it, multiply it with a diverging conformal factor that blow, takes this one point and it blows it up to infinity, okay? So that's how you get the second sphere. So the second sheet really corresponds to just a single point in this manifold up here. Oh, I see. So, so, it's, so, so it's not a singular, it's actually, it, it just gives you the... It's a, it gives you... I, interestingly, uh, r equals zero, r equals zero. zero okay, is actually a flat point. It's, it's the infinity of the other sheet. Okay? It's basically in the, in, uh, in the Penrose diagram. Okay, basically, our solution is this, this hypersurface. It goes from one spatial infinity to the other spatial infinity. This corresponds to little r little r equals infinity, this corresponds to little, little r equals zero, this corresponds to little r equals m half, okay? And in fact, it's an is isometry between any point here to any point there. It's, there's a symmetry, right? I can identify points, all right? Exactly right. It, 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 so I'm glad you're asking that because I've kind of swept that question under the rug. I just told you, oh, look, there's, there's black holes, right? How do I know that? Right? I would have to establish that there are horizons, okay? And it, for the single black hole, it's actually reasonably easy to show that, in fact, there is a horizon at, at, at m, r, m half, okay, which corresponds to this point. For multiple black holes, you actually have to figure out where is the horizon, it will not be exactly at that point because it will also be affected by the other black holes, okay? But you're absolutely right. You, you have to basically find out where are horizons, you have to locate those, and that establishes that indeed there is a black hole. Yes? And then physically, uh, you would not, you'd be only interested in one That's right. That's right. You say basically, let's say this one is our universe, and now basically they're black holes, they have horizons. Really, what's inside the horizon is a separate question. But now these black holes move around, they emit gravitational waves. This, these waves propagate to our infinity. That's what we want to observe. That's, that's something physical that we can measure, or so we hope. Right? And in principle, you could not say, I mean, it could be that. Anything else? Then what we should do is talk about the conformal transformation of the extended curvature. Okay, so to talk about how can we solve the momentum constraint. So far, we've only talked about the Hamiltonian constraint, and we've made our lives easy by choosing a kij equal being zero time symmetry. Okay, so how can we generalize that? Yes. Uh, I wish you had not asked that question. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, you would get something crazy. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I'm, let's not speculate on this. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's talk about the conformal transformation of the extended curvature. Conformal transformations of the extrinsic <coughs> Curvature. Okay. So what I will do. So what we did is we before we took the spatial metric, and we introduced a conformal rescaling of the spatial metric by multiplying it with some power of this conformal factor psi. Okay. 
Now what we'll do, you could ask, well, can we just do the exact same thing with the extremity curvature? In principle, we could. It turns out it's more, we get e equations that are easier to deal with if before doing that, we split the extrinsic curvature in one part that contains the trace of the extrinsic curvature and one part that takes, contains the traceless part. Okay? So what I'll do is I'll write Kij as Aij plus one third gamma Ij K. And we've previously defined K as the trace of Kij. So this is gamma Ij Kij, right? Let me convince you that AIJ is indeed, oh wait, how, actually, how would I convince you that AIJ is indeed traceless, right? I want this to be traceless. How can I do that? I contract AIJ with a metric, right, with gamma IJ. So let's, uh, let's check, okay, whether this is true. Gamma, gamma IJ, K, AIJ, that's what I want to do. What is that? That's gamma ij times, now I insert the definition, so I get 1 kij, and then I get a minus 1 third gamma ij k, right? You agree? What does the first term give me? K. What does the second term give me? Sorry? So I get, a, so I agree, with, I agree with the minus, yes? And then I get a gamma ij, gamma ij. What is gamma ij, gamma ij? It's three, right? Because I can also write that as gamma ii, right? Or actually, gamma ii, which actually you played with on, uh, in the tutorial. That's how we count dimension. This is our three-dimensional three spatial slice. So this is three. And I forgot a factor of one-third. So these two cancel. So this is zero, right? Just a little reality check. Then what I'll do is I'll say, OK, fine, if I split the x and the curvature into these two different parts, now actually I have a freedom. I can rescale these two different parts differently. Okay? Now we could spend some time motivating how we should rescale each one of these two parts, but we don't have all that much time left. So I'll just tell you, we won't rescale the trace k at all. We'll leave it as it is. Okay? And we'll introduce a rescaling of AIJ as, as, as this. And we and rescale AIJ with the upper indices as psi to the minus 10 A bar. And I choose this exponent purely out of convenience. And what makes this convenient is that in that case, the divergence of AIJ rescales as psi to the minus 10 dj bar a bar ij, OK? And this will also be something that will entertain you this afternoon in the tutorial. I'll ask you to prove this, OK? And by doing that proof, you recognize that, aha, this rescaling is really the most convenient, because then I get the simple uh, relationship for the, for, the, uh, uh, for the divergence, OK? Otherwise, you would get extra terms and would be more messy. Also, how, if this is true, how do we want to rescale the lower indices? Well, we want to rescale the lower indices so that we raise and lower indices of AIJ with the conform related metric. Okay? So we want this. For the spatial metric, for the physical AIJ, we have this is related to the upper indices by just lowering the indices with gamma. So this gamma IK, gamma JL, AKL. Okay? And now I can use the conformal rescaling of the gammas. That is, I get a factor of psi to the 4 from each one. So there's a factor of psi to the 8. And then I have gamma bar ik, gamma bar jl. Now this a is given, rescaled like that. So that gives me a psi to the minus 10 times a bar kl. And now I notice if I basically collect these psi's, I can lower these indices of a if I rescale this, it, it, I, or I just get uh, uh, psi to the minus 2a bar I, um, ij. Okay, so that means I now raise and lower indices with a conformally related metric, and that's consistent if I have this rescaling. Okay, then we can do the following. Okay, in the, ha in the Hamiltonian constraints, remember we have this uh, 
this term kij, kij. Oops, not like that, right? Now let's insert our decomposition into this, and then we get this. We have an aij plus one third gamma ij k times aij plus one third gamma ij k, right? So I simply inserted this expression into the, that square of kij, all right? Now, what do we get from that? Well, the first term is just this contraction of Aij. Okay. Then we get mixed terms, right? We get, for example, this term times that term. Do we get that one? No. Why is it zero? Because I'm taking the trace of Aij. So it, it, lovely. Okay. No mixed terms. So the only term left then is this one, right? And what is that term? That will be? OK, so I heard a one third. And is that, is that what I heard? Or one ninth? One third, OK. The general mumbling makes it pretty uh, safe to say something. Uh, anyway, right? So why is it one third instead of one ninth? Because we also have this contraction of the metric that gives a factor of three, right? Now we can insert our conformal rescaling, and that gives me a psi. I get a psi to the minus 2 from one, a psi to the minus 10 from the other. So this is a psi to the minus 12. Aij bar, Aij bar, plus 1 third k squared. Okay? And this I can now insert into the Hamiltonian constraint. Uh, so to find the Hamiltonian constraint, d squared psi minus psi 8 r bar. This is the same as before, but now we'll insert that expression for the excellent curvatures. Then we get a psi to the minus 7 8 a bar ij a bar ij minus 1 12th psi to the fifth k equals minus 2 pi psi to the fifth rho. OK, there we go. That's our Hamiltonian constraint. Okay. So, so far, this hasn't really helped us all that much because we still don't know yet what these aij's are. OK, but the important point is that we can now deal with the momentum constraint. So let's see what we get for the momentum constraint. The key term in the momentum constraint is um, the um, divergence of kij, okay, which is dj kij. And now we, again, insert first our decomposition of kij into a, a trace, three part and a, and a trace. That gives me the following. I have a dj aij plus one third gamma ij djk. Okay. Why do I not get a term of the covariant derivative of gamma ij? Because they're compatible with each other, right? That, that is zero. I only get a term from that one. Now, this is the term for which we needed this funky rescaling of aij. Okay, this is the term for which we chose this rescale of ten, uh, uh, minus 10. So that, means, so, that, so that we can write this as psi to the minus 10 dj aij plus 1 third psi to the minus 4th. And now I'll write this as gamma bar ij djk. Am I allowed to put a bar on this d, by the way? Who votes yes? I am allowed to put a bar on this. Who votes no? I am not allowed to put a bar on that. I am profoundly disappointed. This is the biggest democracy in the world, I'm told. You are not making use of your democratic rights. Okay. <laughs> Who votes? Yes, I am allowed to put a bar on that. 
Okay, now I convinced one person, that's great. <laughs> Who votes, no, I'm not allowed to put a bar on this. Who votes, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, that's the majority, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right, what kind of a term is the K? It's a scalar. What is the covariant derivative of the scalar? It's a partial derivative, right? So does it matter? Any covariant derivative is a partial derivative for a scalar, right? So does it matter whether there's a bar on here or not? Because if I write out the conformal the, the, the covariant derivative, it's just a partial derivative. Right? Let's vote again. Who votes? I can put a bar on this. Hmm. My you know, speech didn't really help very much, did it? <laughs> okay. Okay, let's do it again, okay? So if this is a scalar, right? Then any covariant derivative is just dj k is, is just partial j k, right? Do we, do we agree? And why is that? Well, because there is no index on the k that would allow me to use any Christoffel symbols to expand this covariant derivative, right? So now let me ask you this. What then is dj k? Well, that is the same thing. I get the partial derivative. If this were a vector, then I would now have to use the gamma Christoffel symbols with a bar. But this is not a vector. There's no room for any Christoffel symbols. So these are the same. Let me ask again. Am I allowed to put a bar on this? Yes, OK. All right, good. All right, very good. OK. All right. Um, so now I can insert this into the momentum constraint, and then I get the following. So fine. The, I have no idea where I started this sentence. So, oh no, that, I guess that's still consistent. OK, great. To find the momentum constraint. So the co momentum constraint has basically this term and then another term that kind of looks like this. And what you get is dj a bar ij minus 2 thirds Psi to the 6, I multiply with the psi to the 10, okay? Times gamma bar ij d bar j k equals 8 pi psi to the 10 si. That's our momentum constraint, okay? And now you should ask. Great, and how is that useful? <laughs> okay. um, well, it's actually what, what I was hoping optimistically would be able to do is go one more step, okay? and that is to decompose this Aij into again two parts. Okay? One part that is so-called transverse, uh, it, it, it trace less transverse, and another part is lo that is longitudinal. But I'm, we have only 10 more minutes or so left. I, I don't think we really have time to do that. So instead, I will skip that part, and I'll just t tell you that actually, if we make a couple of choices, we can again derive analytical solutions to this. Okay? So I'll just sketch how that works. And then actually this afternoon, I'll show you at the beginning of the tutorial how you do this decomposition. And then we'll actually derive one of these solutions all the way. Okay. So, um, but skipping th that step, I'll, 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 we'll do the following, okay? So the first coupled, right? I cannot solve the Hamiltonian constraint for the conformal factor without knowing Aij. And likewise, I cannot solve for Aij <laughs> without knowing the conformal factor. So they're coupled. I need to solve these equations simultaneously, which is generally a pain, right? Except, if you remember that we still have freely specifiable variables, we can still make choices, okay? Right, we only have to solve for four variables. We've used the Hamiltonian constraint to solve for psi, but really there are, only th there are three equations here for a total of six unknowns in Kij. So we still have free choices to make, okay? In particular, we can choose the trace to be zero. What happens if the trace, is zero, trace k is zero? Then this term is gone, right? 
What happens if, in addition, we want to construct black hole solutions, then this matter term is gone, OK? And what do you observe? The only equation left is, the only term left is this one, which is independent of psi. That's a beauty, right? Because now we can solve this equation independently of the Hamiltonian constraint. What else do you notice? It is not only independent of psi, it is also? It's linear, okay? So again, if we solve one solution to this, we can add solutions and get multiple ones, okay? Lovely, right? So let's write this down. Okay. Um, what are those solutions, those analytical solutions called when you get them? Those are the famous Bowen-York solutions. So Bowen-York solutions to the momentum constraint. Okay? We can choose vacuum. That means that SI is zero. And we can choose the trace of K to be zero. Actually, that choice has a, f has a fancy name. Does anybody know by any chance what that means? What, it, what, it's, what it's called? It's maximal slicing. It's called maximal slicing. So if we choose maximal slicing, that is k equals 0. Okay. Okay. Why is this called maximal slicing? I imagine you have some, some wire loop of some form, okay? any shape. And now imagine you have a, a soap film that is spent by this wire loop. Do you, do you, can you imagine what I, what I mean? This is, and maybe you, you, know, you give it to kids and you blow through and you make these bubbles and whatnot, right? So imagine we have some loop. We have a soap film. Let's ignore gravity. Then what, what, what force determines the, the shape of that soap film? It's only surface tension. The surface tension will do what? It will make the surface minimal, right? So, it, so basically the surface tension will ensure that the soap film has the smallest surface possible. And in fact, the smallest surface possible corresponds to, it turns out, that the, the, the curvature being, the, ma the trace of the curvature being zero. You could actually show that, okay? So that would be a so-called minimal surface, okay? But it's, it's a minimal surface because that's in, 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 in Euclidean space. If we do this in a Riemannian space, then it turns out the same condition. Really, the condition just tells you that it, it, it gives you a maximum of the, an extremum of the surface. It takes out, turns out it's a minimum in Euclidean space. It's a maximum in Riemannian space. That's why this is maximum slicing. So basically, these are the surfaces that maximize the spatial volume, basically. Okay. Under these conditions, the momentum constraint reduces to d j a i j equals zero, okay? And the beautiful thing about that is that this equation is now linear. That means we can actually solve it, okay? And also, once we have one solution, we can add as many of them as we want. And the other reason, or the, the other reason why we can solve it is because it decouples from the Hamiltonian constraint, okay? So it's decoupled from the Hamiltonian constraint. Okay, and then uh, we can, if we further assume conformal flatness, meaning that this is just a flat differential operator, okay? So assuming conformal flatness, we can then derive uh, analytical solutions. Okay. And in fact, I told you this afternoon, I'll show you how we can do that. But in the meantime, just to wrap up this morning's lecture, I'll write down two of those solutions, which are very important. They're very well known. They're used a lot. There's one solution, A, okay, that describes a black hole that is spinning. with an angular momentum 
jk, okay, and that solution is given by aij equals 6 divided by r cubed, uh, li, symmetric part, epsilon bar, j, kl, and then we have a jk, ll, where this li it just is xi divided by r, and r is just x squared, r squared is x squared plus y squared plus z squared, if, if you want, okay? So in, in Cartesian coordinates, okay? All right, so this is, this L is just like a normal vector that points away from the point at which my black hole sits. The black hole sits at r equals zero, okay? L is a normal vector at each point that points away from that point. Then uh, this epsilon is our anti-symmetric symbol, the anti-symmetric uh, tensor, rather, okay? So, so basically, that, uh, it's just the epsilon ij. I decorate it with a bar so that the covariant derivative with respect to bar goes away. So it's the epsilon that really lives in this conformally related space. And then jk is, is the angular momentum. So this solution describes a spinning black hole. Okay? And um, we also have a solution for a boosted black hole. Okay? So b black hole boosted with a linear momentum pi okay which is a i j so something is, did I do something wrong or something unclear okay yes sorry Yeah, th this is the epsilon. Uh, okay, okay, this is the anti-symmetric epsilon, right? The anti-symmetric tensor. This is not the epsilon plus minus one anymore, right? Yeah. Okay, and the boosted uh, black hole is Aij equals three divided by two r squared times pi lj plus pj li minus gamma bar ij minus li lj lk pk. Okay? All right? Look, I, I have not given you any chance to understand why this is. I did not derive this. Okay? I'm just reporting to you these are solutions to this equation. Okay? And this one we will actually derive this afternoon. Okay, there's, there's a trick how you can do that. All right, and, but the best if you could check. Yes. Sorry, what is? Okay. Yes. Okay. So this physics. What this means? It's the extrinsic curvature that you would get from a rotating black hole. So this describes the extrinsic curvature that, that describes a black hole that sits at a point r equals zero and it has a spin jk. Okay? Likewise, this describes the extrinsic curvature that describes the, uh, the, of a black hole that sits at a point r equals zero and it has a momentum p. Okay? Right? And, and again, you, you, you don't, I did not give you the tools to understand why that is. I also didn't give you the tools to understand how can I see that this solution has a certain momentum. But if we talked about diagnostics, if we talked about how can I actually measure the momentum of a certain space or the angular momentum of a certain space, then we would see that that involves doing some surface integrals at infinity if we, if we performed. And those surface integrals involve the extrinsic curvature. Okay? So if we perform those integrals at infinity of, for example, this solution, then we would find that indeed the linear momentum of the solution is just this p. It pops out out of these terms. Okay? And likewise, if we did a similar integral for the angular momentum for this solution, we would find that it is this. Okay? Okay? All right? Yes? When you take this and you put it into the Hamiltonian constraint equation, you solve it for psi? That's exactly the next step. R equal to zero is no longer another 
Well, yeah. it's it basically it, in an embedding diagram, it would still be another infinity, but it's the, it, 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 it describes a rotating black hole or a spinning black hole, okay? Just like before, it described a non spinning black hole or non boosted black hole, okay? But you're absolutely right. These are now solutions only to the momentum constraints. We had not done yet, right? To complete the construction of initial data, we need solutions to both the momentum constraint and the Hamiltonian constraint. These solutions, are our, the solutions that we had here earlier today, would no longer satisfy the Hamiltonian constraint because now we have non-zero AIJs, right? So now what we need to do is we need to insert these AIJs into the Hamiltonian constraint, and then we need to solve that, okay? Now, in fact, you can do that analytically for small p's or for small j's, and you can get perturbative solutions. That's kind of amusing to do, okay? But of course, if you really want to get uh, nonlinear solutions, then you have to do that numerically. And in fact, that's what you will do next week when you learn about solving elliptic equations. You will solve exactly this problem. Okay, let me actually write this down and I'll make one more comment after that. So it's exactly what you said. Basically, we now need to insert these into the Hamiltonian constraints. To complete construction of initial data. Okay? So, for example, uh, we could now ask now we have this outline complete, right? We can say, great, so we can build black holes that initial data, at least for black holes, that carry a certain linear momentum or a certain spin. We can take these analytical solutions, these bone York solutions, we can insert them into the Hamiltonian constraint. Next week, you will learn how to solve those, that Hamiltonian constraint numerically. Then you have numerical solutions to the conformal factor. You have complete initial data to construct these black hole initial data. Okay? So, uh, how, for example, you could ask, great, so how do I build a binary black hole initial data set? Maybe I want two black holes that orbit each other. Okay, at a certain separation, okay? how would I do that? Well, how would you do it? The beautiful thing is these solutions still satisfy a linear equation, so I can take two of them. Okay? Let me take one black hole here. Let, let me give it a boost in that direction. Okay? Let me put another black hole here. Let me give it a boost in this direction. How do I do that? For each one, I pick a certain p. Maybe this vector p points in that direction, this vector p points in this direction. Now I have two black holes at a certain separation. They have a certain linear momentum. I can write down the excentric curvature analytically that describes that black hole pair. You insert that into the Hamiltonian constraint. You solve one Laplace equation. That's all, right? It's one Laplace equation. You get the conformal factor, and you have valid initial data describing a binary black hole in circular orbit, or, or a binary, b binary orbit, whether or not it's circular, there's one more condition that you need to satisfy. Okay? But that completes the construction of initial data. Okay? Anyway, that's what this formalism is good for. Okay? So that's enough for this morning. This afternoon, I'll give you some more details on how to, to derive this, and then there'll some exercise and some of the steps you can fill in that I skipped over this morning. Thank you. Break.